Good morning. Welcome to Silver Lake United Methodist Church. I am Reverend Christine Potter, and it's so wonderful to be here to worship with you today and to see all of your bright faces this morning. Um, we have a, just a few announcements, so if you want to look in your um, insert in your bulletin, we can start there. Okay, but actually, before I get too far, I'm going to announce birthdays so that I don't forget today. It's very exciting. Um, okay, so the birthdays that I have for this week, and please raise your hand if I've missed you because I'm trying to get these caught up. I think I missed somebody last week. Um, we have Dixie Little uh, on the 20th. Her birthday is on the 20th. Uh, Dennis Johnson McDonald, oh, sorry, that's not right. Dennis Johnson is on the 21st. Um, Aiden Stoffer McDonald is uh, on the 23rd, and Brenna, is, Brenna Stoffer McDonald Stoffer is on, also on the 23rd. Um, so happy birthday to all of them, and did I miss anybody who's here? Alyssa Thomas's was on the 14th last week. Alyssa Thomas. Thank you. That's who I missed last week. Okay, wonderful. So we'll be in prayer for all of them and their birthdays this week. One more, one more. Oh, one more, oh my goodness. Cindy Circle's birthday is on Tuesday. She was supposed to be here, but she just messaged that there's a train like completely stopped, so I don't think she's going to, to oh, make no. it. So Cindy Circle. Circle. My mom. On Tuesday. Oh, that's your mom. Okay, anybody else? All right. All right. So that's it for birthdays. Um, in your insert, we have uh, the youth group kickoff is tonight. Uh, we're very excited about that. Uh, we actually just got a new grill for the occasion and because I wanted a grill. Um, but anyway, so that'll be exciting. I'm looking forward to having all the youth and families out tonight. Uh, the church garage sale, still um, accepting items. I saw the sign as I came in today that the, uh, that the garage sales... Uh, <laughs> being shared with the community, so um, looking forward to that. Harvest Home, we're still doing preparations for that, and Kathy may have more to say about that. I'll leave that to her. Um, T-shirt orders are still in the back on that table back there. Um, we're gonna do two more weeks of T-shirt order sales, so um, if you will, if you have any questions, just let me know. I'm kind of uh, taking charge of ordering those, so um, they are T-shirts for our Do Unto Others series that's coming up in about a month. Um, so sign up in the back for that. Uh, next week, our district superintendent, Jenny Collins, Reverend Jenny Collins, is going to, not next week. No. Does that say next week? Nope, September 1st. So in two weeks, um, she will be coming here uh, to uh, help lead worship and to share the message. Um, I will be I will not be here that day and she graciously offered to come and and preach so that's super exciting um, So mark your calendars to be here that day if you want to hear her share a message which you do um, Birthday corrections um, I Did not put a thing out on the table in the narthex because we're having a printer issue right now So next week I will have something in the back for you to check um, and make sure I have your correct birthday Because I don't want to keep missing birthdays so um, I think that is it. I have added to this list what's coming up in worship, so you know what series are coming up in the next couple of months. Um, so that's there for you to see. And I think that that is it for my announcements. Are there other announcements? Um, as we start preparing for Harvest Home, we've got Pi Day coming up in September on, I believe, the 21st. And um, there's a list in the back of the Pi filling type items that we need. And so if you are out shopping and buy some of those cans, bring them on in um, and we'll gather all those and then towards the end, see what we still need to get all of our pies made. And then we will buy the crust. And so if you feel like contributing some money to help buy the crust, that'd be great. Um, but I just buy all the crusts and then we will put them together on that date. And if you wanna stay that afternoon and help, many hands make light work. So, thank you. Is it right after worship? Okay. Any other announcements?
I would just like to thank everyone that came to the meal Wednesday evening and also apologize because we misjudged the amount that we needed. <laughs> so many of the people, you know, we said, take whatever is left. If you want to eat corn, pies, whatever, take it and not pay. But they ate and they still paid and we took oh. in about $480, I think. Wow, like fantastic. Yeah. Anyway. Thank you so much for doing that. All right, anybody else before our call to worship? Okay. Please rise in body or spirit and join in our call to worship. God, we gather today to explore, to explore scripture, our faith, and the witness of others who have walked the line. We seek to find you in expected and unexpected places, in scripture and in song, the sacred and secular. Give us eyes to see the sacred in all your people, in all your world. Uh, before we sing today and we pass the peace, um, I just want to invite people that, um, so there's a, there's a little bit of an uptick in COVID and t from now until uh, like the next booster. And so um, some folks may, may or may not want to shake hands or fist bump or elbow. So um, you also may just greet one another without any um, physical touching um, so please just be sensitive to each other and but at this time just invite you to say hello and good morning to one another may be seated. Please join me in our unison prayer. God, 
of us all, we spend our lives trying to figure things out and even trying to figure you out. Sometimes it is easy to recognize your presence and other times it is not so easy. Give us patience, trust, and wonder to see all the mysterious ways you bring light and love to our lives. We want to be your people, receiving your light and shining that light for all the world. May it be so. Amen. All right. Come on down, kiddos. Come on in. They're waiting so excitedly. I think we should try something. Next week before worship, everybody stand out in the hallway and just come running in with excitement before. <laughs> you guys are good leaders. Yeah. Okay. So I don't have any props with me today. We're just going to talk. Okay. Oh, man. They're so disappointed. <laughs> okay. I have a question for you today. How many of you went back to school already? And how many of you are going to go back to school this week? Okay. Uh huh. I'm going to go to school, um, with Ollie, but he's going to kindergarten and then I'm going to school. That is amazing. I'm really excited for you. So I have a question. Ruthie gets more fun and she doesn't have to do lots of math. She doesn't have to do lots and lots of math. Well, I was a math teacher, so kind of offended by that comment. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I have a question for you all. Do you, when you go to school, do you have like rules in the classroom? Yeah, yeah what are some of those rules? Yeah? No pushing. No, pushing. no, punching, no, punching. no punching, that's also a good rule, yeah? No, no taking, no, Be no, kind? No, no, no taking books, no taking books. No taking books that are not your own books? Yeah? Do, do you think those are good rules? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. Um, are there any rules that are kind of hard to follow? Yeah, like what? Can you think of any? Hopefully not the non-punching one. You know what rule I have a hard time with sometimes that I won a couple times I got in trouble with at school? No talking. No talking while the, like, while the teacher's talking. That was kind of hard, isn't it? Because sometimes you have something really important to tell your friend and you can't wait, right? But why do you think we have that rule? No talking during the teacher's talking. Yeah? Yeah, so that you don't miss anything when you're trying to learn, right? Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit more about rules today. And sometimes rules are kind of a bummer. But sometimes rules are good, right? So that we don't hurt each other and so that we don't... Oh, yeah. So we, there's just all kinds of different rules, and we're going to talk more about that today in the scriptures that we read and everything. But do you think God has any rules? Yeah? You think so? What do you think would be a rule that God would have? You don't know. This is tricky. It's a hard one. Do you think that God would want us to be kind? Yeah? You think God wants us to be kind? So that's kind of a rule like at school, right? Yeah. We Have you heard of the Ten Commandments before? Those are kind of like rules, aren't they? Yeah? So the Bible has, has, has lots of different rules that God has given that people have in their minds. Um, so we'll talk more about that. But... When we break a rule, do we feel, how do we feel? How do you feel when you break a rule? Kind of bad? Yeah. Sometimes you get in trouble, right? When you break a rule. Today, what I want you to know is that even when you break a rule or do something maybe that you wish you didn't do, guess who still loves you? God. God still loves us no matter what we do. And that's really awesome, isn't it? And other people still love you too, right? Your parents, your grandparents, your friends. That's really good, isn't it? All right. Well, let's pray together, shall we? 
Okay. God, we thank you for being with us today. We thank you that there are some rules that are good for us. And most of all, we thank you that when we break the rules, you still love us and give us a second chance and a third chance and all kinds of chances. We love you and we thank you. And we all said, amen. All right, thanks friends. All right, so now we're going to um, talk about our joys and concerns together. Um, there are a couple things that I want to lift up today. This one is actually still more of an announcement, or it could be a concern. Um, I received an email uh, from Pastor Cameron the other, the other day that someone had been receiving like scam email. Um, I'm seeing a couple heads going like this. So if you get an email from him, um, it is likely a scam. So don't open it, don't do anything with it, just delete it. Um, he would go through me if he were trying to reach out to you. So he wanted me to let you know that so that you don't get into any issues with your technology. Um, also want to announce that Judy Howe, Judy Howe isn't here, right? No, okay, so um, I spoke with her yesterday on the phone the evening before she was taken to Stormont um, Friday night, and she's having some tests run. Um, not yesterday, I hadn't heard any really more specifics, so if other people have specifics, but um, she didn't think she'd be here today and wanted me to let everyone know um, that she was there. So um, please lift up some prayers for her, um, and if you have more information to give, then please share that as well. Um, prayers for uh, Kathy this Friday. Um, Jensen will have his left ear cochlear implantation um, on Friday morning. And so um, she said she's keeping busy right now because she's a little nervous and anxious. So um, I know she appreciates our prayers and thoughts. So um, please direct them her way and give her some extra love this week. Um, the last thing that I have before I take uh, prayer concerns is, um, as you know, uh, Dale Fry passed uh, several weeks ago, and um, after the funeral, I was able to have some really beautiful conversation with his daughter, Patricia, um, who I did not really get the opportunity to um, speak with before the funeral. Um, and so she really, um, was it was on her heart to share some of her own stories about Dale. And so I wanted to just share a couple of those with you um, to honor her and to honor him um, in this moment. So I have, she's kind of written a whole um, beautiful letter that she worked with on her, with her kids. Um, and so I'm gonna put it in the back if you'd like to read the whole thing, it's beautiful. Um, but for now, I'm just gonna share just a few stories with you. Uh, so this is from, from Patricia. She says, when I think of my father, I see the little boy with blonde curls who grew up on a farm just north of town in Silver Lake. Blue eyes, big smile, charming, a little ornery, but in a good way. He spent the first 19 years of his life on that farm before he married my mom, and the two of them together created a world that blossomed right in the heart of Silver Lake. Dad shared many useful beliefs when I was growing up, and some of the silliest are some of the best memories I have. For example, and I always think about it now when I hear a train, um, trains will roll through Silver Lake last night, and there were many times I'd or late at night, sorry, and there were many times I'd hear the lonely sound of a train whistle as I laid in bed. Some whistles were very clear and crisp, while others were hollow and empty. Today, I live miles from any train tracks, but on occasion, I will hear the hollow sound of a train as it rumbles through. And I can hear Dad say, hear how hollow that sounds? It's going to rain, and it does. If a train isn't available to tell me when to grab an umbrella, I can always look at the moon to determine if it's a wet moon or a dry moon. As dad explained it, think of the moon as a container and you're pouring water into it. If the shape is such that the water will spill out, it's a wet moon. If the moon will hold the water, it's a dry moon. Anybody hear that before? 
Yeah, okay, that's fun. My children grew up believing the wet moon made it rain, and I think Grandpa Dale got a kick out of that. I know I still believe. Uh, and then this last one, uh, we had a good laugh when she shared about this, so I'll share this last uh, memory. Uh, a story Dad has told a million times is when Max, Val, and Delaney were standing in the bed of Grandpa Dale's truck feeding the cows one evening. They'd grab alfalfa pellets and hand feed the yearlings, yearlings as they crowded around the truck. Cows are quite docile, unless they're scared. At some point, Delaney lost her balance and tumbled over the side of the truck. Grandpa, fearing the cows might jump at the sudden appearance of a little one standing in their way of alfalfa pellets, was sure he would hear her scream or cry. But when he got to the edge of the bed, he saw Delaney stand up and come around the side of the truck. He reached down, plucked her up by the back of her shirt, and plopped her back into the safety of the truck bed. Next thing he knew, she picked up more pellets and was feeding the cows again. She wasn't scared at all. He said it was because she was a little farm girl, but I think it's because she knew her Grandpa Dale was there to protect her. The thing I'll miss the most is hearing you say, this is to, to Dale, on hot days just like this, it's close out there. Because when it's hot and humid and the air is pressing down in an oppressive way, it does feel close, doesn't it? And when I think of that, I feel close to you. Thank you for being my dad and for being a wonderful grandpa to Max, Val, and Delaney. I love you bunches, Patricia. Um, at this time, I would love to take any joys or concerns from the rest of you that we can lift up today. Jan Lowry is having hip surgery this Friday, I believe it is. Um, I, I just noticed later this week, um, but she, they were able to get her in pretty quick, and so she's looking for some relief on her hip. I just want to say thank you for the prayers for Sammy and family. They arrived safely in Washington State. And now Mike and Julie are headed here from Washington, D.C. No. So they'll be here tomorrow night. All right, prayers for their travel as well. I actually have a couple of prayers. The first one is um, my mom's going to be having a procedure on Tuesday to have the stimulator removed from her back. Um, I can tell you which year she, what year she had that done, but it didn't work since the time they put it in. Probably worked for a couple of weeks and then it didn't work, so hopefully that's gonna give her some relief. And then I would like to um, ask you for a prayer for my friend, Michael Cash. Uh, he lives in California, but he's been very instrumental in supporting me in my grief training um, that I've been going to, and he, he could use your prayers. He has lung cancer in stage four. So. Prayers for him and your mom. A couple things on my mind this morning. Some of you have asked about Jane. Uh, we finally found out that she tore a rotator cuff in her left arm, which means she doesn't have a lot of range of motion in that arm. Uh, we're supposed to go see the orthopedic people sometime later this month, see what they have to say, to keep her in mind. And Jackson remind, reminds me this morning that there's going to be a lot of kids his age start college tomorrow morning. You to keep them in prayer too. Yes. Ruthie starts her very first day of school ever tomorrow. She's yes. going to start three-year-old preschool, and she's gone back and forth about 12 times as to whether or not she's actually going. So <laughs> fingers crossed she walks through the door. <laughs> All right. Let's go together now in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we take this moment to still ourselves, 
to breathe in your breath of life and breathe out. We give you thanks for your presence with us. We give you thanks for your unconditional love for us. We give thanks today that you share in every joy and every sorrow that we have as your people, as individuals and as a community. We pray for those who are returning to school, those who are going to a new class or going to school for the first time. May these transitions be gentle and joyful. Be with not only those students, but also with their families as all transition during this time. We ask you for healing for those who are in the hospital, for those who have received new news about past injuries, for those who can't be here with us today because of illness or mobility issues. We imagine those persons in our minds and wrap our arms around them in spirit. We thank you for birthdays, for the cool weather that comes and goes, all the new things that are happening around us. We thank you for this moment just to center ourselves, to acknowledge that God, you are in each and every one of these things that sometimes maybe we don't remember you're involved in. But we give you thanks and we ask you to continually remind us of your presence in our lives as we pray together as a community the words that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
All right. So today, uh, before we hear the scripture and the sermon, our uh, pew talk is uh, about Johnny Cash. So the question is, what do you know about Johnny Cash? Do you think of him as someone to learn faith lessons from? Why or why not? Our scripture readings this morning come from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 39 to 42, Proverbs 13, verse 3, and Galatians, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Please rise in body or spirit and join me for the reading of the scripture. First from Luke, he also told them a parable, can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above the teacher, but every disciple who is fully qualified will be like the teacher. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do you do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, friend, let me take out the speck in your eye when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Now from Proverbs, those who guard their mouths preserve their lives. Those who open wide their lips come to ruin. And from Galatians, for the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. May we always read and hear scripture with the intention to do no harm, to do good, and to stay in love with God and all of creation. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Although it may be a good exercise for people to see if they can stay standing during the whole sermon. Walk around. A walking sermon. That'd be fun. Okay. So, do no harm. Do good, stay in love with God and all creation. This is our intention and our prayer each Sunday after we read and hear scripture. Today, we're going to talk a little bit more about why. Today, we begin a new worship series entitled, Walk the Line, John and Johnny on Faith. I anticipated that some of you hearing the title, will know who at least one of the Johns are in this series. Some of you, I'm sure, know both right away. And some of you, like my children, which I am, never mind, I won't say. Some of you, like a couple of my children, in this moment are asking the question, who are either of these guys? And what do they have to do with our weekly prayer after scripture? So first, the who. We have two Johnnies. One Johnny lived in Europe in the 1700s. He grew up in a very prim and proper English family. He was highly educated at Oxford University, 
was a devout Christian who became an Anglican priest and today is known as the founder of the United Methodist Movement. His name is John Wesley. I don't think anybody called him Johnny Wesley, but maybe somebody did at some point. The other Johnny lived in America 200 years later in the 1900s. He grew up in Arkansas and was the son of a poor sharecropper. This Johnny had very few prospects for education. He enlisted in the Air Force, Air Force was a hard living Southern Baptist and became a traveling country singer. His name is Johnny Cash. Two very different people from very different times and places and contexts, and yet somehow, when taken together, they have some very similar things to teach us about faith. And I love that about the mystery and wonder of our interconnectedness, that we can take two such very different things and bring them together and learn from them. That is such an amazing uh, part of who we are as God's people. And we can constantly discover and learn by seeking all kinds of new connections together. So anyway, in this series, we are exploring what these two Johnnies have to show us about faith. And specifically, what we as United Methodists refer to as the three general rules. How many of you would say that you're a rule follower? Okay, less of you than I thought. Okay, now you're, get, now you're getting your hands up. Okay, I'm not gonna like tell people on you or anything. I'm not taking notes, so. Um, how many of you uh, would say that you're a rule breaker or that you at least like to break a rule or two? Okay, I've got, people are more scared to answer that one. Okay, <laughs> there's some honest children out there. We all know the saying, like, rules are made to be broken, right? Uh, personally, I would have to say that I'm definitely a little bit of both. I am for sure a little bit of both. I have always grown up, going to school and everything, I was that kid who wanted to be the good student. So I was always trying to follow the rules, even though I got in trouble for talking that one time. Um, but I was, I was one of those people. And often, as we talked about in the children's message today, rules are there for very important reasons, right? Practical reasons. So um, some examples that I was thinking of earlier this week are traffic laws. Raise your hand if you like traffic laws. Okay, yeah, like I really would prefer not to live in a place where there are no traffic laws, or at least understood traffic laws. <laughs> um, laws against all kinds of crimes, like theft or... Um, just any kind of harm to one another, right? Those are, those are good laws, good rules, completely important. Um, even if we take it away from laws, imagine playing a card game that has no rules. Can you even imagine playing the game? Like, it doesn't make any sense, right? So when I was, um, I used to serve at Emporia First United Methodist Church, and when I was there, um, for confirmation, I would always work with the youth director there, um, who's now a very good friend of mine, um, and we would always play this game when we were talking about rules. And the game would go something like this, and I, I thought about playing it today altogether, but then it sounded like it was gonna be too chaotic, so I'm not gonna make you do that. So we would gather all the kids together in this wide open space um, with no, it was kind of like a gymnasium, and the directions would be, okay, we're all gonna play a game together, you get to create the game, and the only stipulation is that there are no rules. So I wish we had videos to show of the way that this game went because it was, as you can imagine, complete chaos. At first it was like, oh yeah, there are no rules. We can do whatever we want. So people are just sort of running around aimlessly with different, you know, soccer ball, football, just throwing it around. And pretty soon they're like, what, there's no, what do we do? Like, and so we have kids coming up and saying, um, can we say that like, 
you have to kick the ball in this direction if you're on this team and, and we would say, no, that, is that a rule? Then you can't do that. So as you can imagine, they kept coming up to us with ideas and we would ask them if it was a rule and it was always a rule because you have to have rules to play a game, right? So that was just a really um, practical and visible way to understand the importance and the, good, uh, the goodness behind rules. Um, but I do also have to admit that throughout the years of my own life and just in the social world in general, I've encountered some rules that I felt needed to be broken and that others felt needed to be broken. Some of them I'm not gonna share today. But not all rules are good rules. Close your ears if you're a child right now. <clears throat> Some rules harm specific people, like laws that women or people of color can't vote. That used to be a rule, right? That used to be a law, bad law. The Jim Crow laws and the whole notion of separate but equal thought that was a fair rule, realized that's not a good rule, right? The stance of some churches even still today that women should be silent. You can guess I don't like that rule, right? And it's certainly harmful for at least 50% of the population to be silent. So you can fill in the blank with your own, some of your own things that you don't think are good rules. And there are some rules that I have intentionally not mentioned today because they're divisive. And I don't have a particular reason to rock the boat in that particular way right now. But I do think it is important to name that we don't always agree on which rules there should be, which things require regulation and which don't. We don't always agree. And it's important for us to have honest and loving discourse about those things, which we do really well, right? It's super easy to do. But today we're talking not about those divisive rules. We're talking about three simple rules that I really think all of us agree on. And just maybe, since we can agree on these three rules, those could be the foundation for all kinds of compassionate and loving discourse about the other things that we don't agree on. So these three rules were created by John Wesley, not Johnny Cash, um, and John Cash, <laughs> Johnny, John Wesley um, created these rules when he was working for um, church, uh, he was working to revive the church. So John Wesley never intended to start a whole nother church called the United Methodist Church. He was just trying to renew the church, the Anglican church that he was a part of. So he was working, he was at Oxford University and he was specifically working with young adults and college students who were also at, at Oxford University. So he gathered them together in meetings and he wanted to have a method for his meetings, hence you get the term of Methodist because everything is done methodically and with purpose. Um, and so as part of that method, he came up with three rules for them. Later, these were named the three general rules and they are still in our book of discipline today and are very, very much an important part of who we are as United Methodists. So today we look at the first rule, do no harm. I think first of Johnny Cash's song. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. I keep my eyes wide open all the time. I keep the ends out for the tie that binds because you're mine. I walk the line. I can see some of you, you can sing along with me when I'm doing this. So this song's about walking the line, right? Trying to stay on the straight and narrow, as they say. He keeps a close watch, he keeps his eyes wide open. And he does this not just for some random reason, but he does this walking the line because of love 
because of this relationship, right? And we can only guess that it was probably a relationship with a woman, right? But it could also be, and I love to do this with songs, it could also be our relationship with God, right? Like some of the things we do, we do because we know it pleases God, right? We do it because of relationship. And so for Johnny Cash, this love inspires him to want to walk the line, to be loyal or to do no harm. It sounds easy, or he makes it sound easy. He even says in the song, I find it very, very easy to be true, right? If you know the song, I find it very, very easy. But those of us who know his story know that Johnny Cash had anything but an easy time walking the line and doing no harm. And that is something that we can all relate to in some way. Maybe not the same ways as him, but we can have the best of intentions and yet still cause harm. It happens to us all the time. Um, I think next of Folsom Prison Blues. So you can sing with me if you know it. We're gonna do the... When I was just a baby, my mama told me, son, Always be a good boy, don't ever play with guns. But I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. When I hear that lonesome whistle, I hang my head and cry. <laughs> I am not Johnny Cash, I can knock it that low. Do no harm. Cash once talked about writing this song and said, I sat with my pen in my hand, trying to think up the worst reason a person could have for killing another person. And that is what came to mind. I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. This song tells a powerful story of regret. Right? It's all about regret. Regret from someone who has, in an awful, awful, awful way, violated that first general rule. Do no harm. And now, he's in prison and reminded over and over again by that lonely whistle of the train of his crime. He thinks of his mama. He thinks of what he has done. He thinks of and sings about his loss of freedom and his longing to be somewhere else. Again, something we can all relate to. Again, not to that extent, but we all, to various degrees, at various times, experience regret, right? And we find ourselves trapped and imprisoned by the poor choices that we made and by the harm that we've done. It's a, it's a different kind of feeling trapped and imprisoned. It might not be fulsome prison blues, but we can all sing songs of regret for harm that we've done. In the sixth chapter of Luke that we read from today, the gospel contains a series of parables in which Jesus is teaching about what it means to follow him and how those who follow him will live in and engage the world. In a couple of verses we read today, he writes, why do, you see the speck of, uh, why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but you don't notice the log in your own eye? And how can you say to your neighbor, friend, let me take that speck out of your eye, when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye then you will see clearly. Before a person can help another person, before a person can do good, they must first do no harm. But it's actually really difficult to do no harm. How do you actually do no harm? Next week, we'll talk about the next rule, which is to do good. 
And in some ways, I think that that rule is a lot more straightforward, right? If, you, if I say, how are you going to do good? You can name a lot of ways in which you're going to help people all week, right? Lots of ways that you're going to do good. But it's harder to anticipate what harm you might potentially do in the future and not do it, right? So for example, have you ever had an encounter with someone um, and something happened between the two of you that clearly caused harm, just that totally came out of nowhere to you, that surprised you? Have you ever had an encounter like that? <clears throat> that can get kind of messy, right? Because once harm is done, once you've said something, it's hard to undo that, right? Maybe impossible to undo it. People have different percep perceptions, perspectives on what happened in that encounter, right? In that disagreement. People have different ways of dealing with reconciliation together. And some people don't even want reconciliation, at least right away, right? Some people take more time. People can lose trust. People can lose patience. There are so many reasons and so many ways that this kind of encounter can be messy. So Proverbs from today, I think, gives us a very direct and helpful piece of advice. It says, those who guard their mouths preserve their lives. Those who open wide their lips come to ruin. That may be a really dramatic way to say that, <laughs> an aggressive way to say that, but it rings true, right? Who, who here has ever said anything to someone that you wish you could take back? Anyone? Yeah, lots of times, right? Sometimes we can do no harm simply by pausing and not saying anything at all in that moment where we are ramped up and ready to spew out lots of wonderful things, right? This is hard for those of us who are vocal and passionate, and I myself am one of those people, so if you are, you're in good company, but it's great advice. We're in such a hurry to talk fast, right? And to have conversation that's so quick these days. But Proverbs reminds us that we can pause and in that pausing, prevent a lot of harm that is done. So what does it look like in your life? We all have different relationships, right? With ourselves and others and God. What does it look like for you to do less harm to others, yourself, and to God? So. We're going to imagine a few scenarios here. And if you're somebody who gets very distracted visually and you want to close your eyes to imagine these things, I invite you to do that at this time. But you also don't have to. I want you to imagine. Imagine how your life would be different waking up every morning and saying specifically, today, I will do no harm to myself. Imagine how your life would be different. Imagine how your relationships would be different waking up every morning and saying, today, I will do no harm to others. How would that change your relationships? With people you love? With people that are moving too slow in traffic? or not giving you good service when you go out to eat, how would that change your relationships? Imagine how the world around you might begin to change if you started every day saying, today I will do no harm to God. What would that mean to you? And what would the world look like because of it? It may seem kind of impossible, right, to do no harm. Like, why even try? But we have to try, right? We are called to do this hard work. That's what it means to follow Jesus. 
It means doing the hard work of doing no harm to ourselves, one another, and God. We're going to mess up, but we'll get better as we go, just like anything we practice, right? And the really good news is that no matter what, God continues to love us unconditionally, no matter how many times we mess up. And knowing that is what sets us free to do the work. Knowing that at our cores frees us for the work. It's not a get out of jail free card. It's not God loves me so it doesn't matter what I do in my life or how I treat other people. That's not how love frees us. That's not how it works. The love of God sets us free from the prisons of regret, from being trapped and haunted by the lonesome whistle of shame and fear and emptiness. And the love of God sets us free from being stuck so that we can move forward to love better and to do no harm. And so, this is my challenge for us this week. To wake each morning with these mantras, these intentions, these commitments, these prayers, however, however you want to think of them for your lives. Today, I will do no harm to myself. Say it with me. Today, I will do no harm to myself. Today, I will do no harm to others. Today, I will do no harm to others. And finally, today, I will do no harm to God. Today, I will do no harm to God. With the mighty help and love of God through Jesus Christ. May it be so. Amen. It's offering time, right? <laughs> okay, I don't have my bulletin with me. I'd like to invite those who are going to come and collect the offering to come forward now. Um, and please, just always a reminder that your, your monetary offerings are so beautiful and important to the church, and so are all the other ways that you're giving um, in body, mind, spirit, with your prayers and um, with your actions. So um, let's take this moment to think about how we will give back to God this week. Let us pray. God, we thank you for all that you have given to us. We ask that you would accept these offerings that we give today.
along with the other offerings that we will give throughout the week of our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness to you and your love. May you bless these gifts and use them for your good in the world. Amen. Can you go back to that slide before, please? This is the benediction for today. Let us go to serve in peace, the gospel to proclaim. God's spirit has empowered us. Let us go now in Jesus' name. Amen.